Okay. So, now today onwards we start discussing laser basics and laser as we know is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation and stimulated uh, emission of radiation is what we want to start with. So, we start talking about something that is very fundamental we have discussed it in our spectroscopy course as well and I am sure most of you would have studied it in your uh, MSc curriculum at least, uh, but still uh, we will revise it in case uh, first of all we need to remind ourselves and secondly in case we had any lacuna in understanding that hopefully we will get sorted out now. So, stimulated emission is what we want to start talking about and the reason why we talk want to talk about lasers is that it is central to any study of ultrafast uh, dynamics. It is central that you use a pulsed laser as light source. So, before we go to the pulse part of it we should at least know how a laser works then only uh, when we uh, talk about how pulsing is done and all it will start making sense. So, what we are doing now is actually like the part before time 0 in our transient absorption or up conversion measurement we are going back to the very basics and uh, in the next couple of modules or 3 modules will be about that. And uh, for this actually one can read from something as fundamental as Macquarie and Simon's book physical chemistry and molecular approach by Macquarie and Simon. So, this is a standard book for uh, undergraduate and well, MSc classes as well uh, the discussion here should be enough for the next couple of modules and then we move on to more sophisticated uh, books right. So, what is stimulated emission uh, those of you who uh, have studied the uh, interaction of radiation of matter from a quantum chemical perspective at least sem semi classical uh, treatment of it at least might remember that the way it was done is that you consider two energy levels let us call them 1 and 2 1 is the lower one 2 is the higher one and we said we asked the question what happens when a photon of appropriate frequency is incident on this system. So, actually two things can happen what is very clear to us is this photon might come and cause an upward transition this I think everybody understands is an absorption absorption process. Now, what is the condition for the photon to be absorbed it must satisfy the Bohr resonance condition H nu 1 2 let us say this frequency is I am writing 1 2 specifically because I want to highlight the fact that uh, the frequency of the photon is such that its energy matches exactly the energy gap between the two states involved. So, when nu 1 2 is incident uh, photon of nu 1 2 is incident on the system we understand very clearly that absorption is going to take place. What we might not understand to start with is that the opposite phenomenon might also be brought about by a photon. This is an emission, but it is not an emission by itself this is called a stimulated emission. this is absorption all right why is it that a photon would uh, cause uh, an emission of another photon because if you go back to the formulation of the problem in uh, semi classical limits the light here actually I should not even say photons if you am talking in semi classical terms because there the molecule is modeled using quantum mechanics light is modeled as a wave that is why it is called a semi classical treatment in the first place. So, let us think like this light which is a wave acts as a perturbation here you have two energy levels you have some uh, population distribution between them what light does is that it disturbs the level and causes a mixing. So, uh, when I say mixing n 1 has to be mixed with n 2 n 2 can also be mixed with n 1 mixing of states in quantum mechanics is equivalent to a transition in spectroscopy. So, here when uh, light comes and causes the transition it can do it both ways to put it very very qualitatively this is stimulated emission and when stimulated emission takes place the light that comes out I can draw it like two curly arrows first of all it is important to understand that light that came in is actually conserved and some more light comes out. Now, I have no option, but to go back to photons if one photon causes the transition 
then two photons come out if there is stimulated emission and if there is no other loss in some other way. Okay. So, this gives you a multiplication of number of photons this is very important to understand and not only that the light that comes out is correlated with the light that caused the downward transition. That is why there are several properties that are associated with light that comes out as a result of stimulated emission may not always be there for uh, spontaneous emission, but we have not even talked about spontaneous emission yet. So, let us see uh, what kind of correlations there will be between light that comes out and light that goes in in a stimulated emission process. First of all, the frequency of the light that comes out is exactly the same nu 1 2 right. So, you get monochromaticity. Secondly, and this is a curious property, let us say this is your sample here, light comes in from this direction, original light goes in, goes out in this direction. The light that is that comes out as a result of stimulated emission will follow the same path. So, in stimulated emission, you get directionality. unlike light that comes out from uh, regular light sources for example, right. Generally the light sources that we have or uh, fluorescent molecules and all that we have they are going to emit in all directions if it is spontaneous you know there is nothing to drive the direction. Here the emission is actually driven by the light that comes in the light that produces a perturbation. We are not doing the math here, but there is something called transition dipole moment that uh, ensures that not only is it directional, but also something else is there. Polarization of the light is maintained. If you uh, put in vertically polarized light and if there is no rotation and all, then uh, stimulated emission light that comes out is also vertically polarized. Okay. And another important property is coherence. Coherence means not only are the two light waves monochromatic, monochromatic means what exactly same wavelength polarized that means the oscillations are in the same plane that is uh, not enough what happens is that they are in step. Light that comes out as a stimulated emission is exactly in phase with the light that causes it. And these are the properties that make stimulated emission a suitable candidate for light amplification and obtaining lasers with the properties that we know that most lasers have. Okay. And this is the uh, simple formulation, but uh, there is something else that we need to discuss here which might sound a uh, little off topic, but actually it is not as you will see by the time we are done. Uh, Einstein did a kinetic treatment of this process. because. Something that is obvious here is that we are not discussing the whole thing. If you only talk about uh, induced photo induced processes, induced absorption if you want to emphasize the induced part of it and induced emission or stimulated emission, then one thing that you are definitely leaving out is spontaneous emission. But Einstein said that that is not practical because spontaneous emission does take place. We see it all the time all around us. So, we cannot say that only stimulated emission takes place even though uh, in the realm of semi classical treatment using time dependent perturbation theory, you only consider induced processes, induced absorption, induced emission. So, what Einstein did was that he brought in this third process, which might actually be more uh, obvious to us than stimulated emission, he brought in spontaneous emission. Okay. So, the way I have drawn it here. In the way that I have drawn it spontaneous emission and stimulated emission actually have the same wavelength because I have only two uh, energy levels and nothing else. But properties that will not be seen in stimulated in spontaneous emission, what will be seen in a stimulated emission are those that we have written here 2, 3, 4. Okay. Of course, 
this is uh, a discussion that was performed several decades ago. Nowadays, people are working on how to get directional spontaneous emission. So, if you read uh, work by Lakovich, they have made some progress in it. Uh, there is something called, I just told you that for amplification stimulated emission is a good candidate, but actually we are going to discuss later when you try to make a laser and try to get amplification of spontaneous emission, one big problem that shows up is AAC. And again that term AAC might be a little confusing because AC is there in laser as well. You just take out the L and take out the R, what you are left with is AC. But when we say AC, then generally we mean amplification of spontaneous emission. Actually, you have to kill amplification of spontaneous emission if you are going to get a good laser. If you work with homemade lasers and if you try to actually get the lasing done, there AC can turn out to be a threat. And the reason why it can turn out to be a threat will come to shortly. Okay. But let us do Einstein's formulation here. What Einstein did was a very simplistic kinetic formulation. All of us have studied chemical kinetics, I hope at least in 11, 12. So, there what we know is we know how to write differential equations. What is the rate? What is rate? It is something like dx dt. Okay. So, we will write the rate equation and to start with we will not even write the dx dt part. We will only write with w the right hand side without w will only write the RHS. Okay. So, let us say we consider the first process absorption. See absorption is sort of like a an elementary bimolecular reaction. Right? You can think it is a reaction between a photon and molecule. Okay. So, if it is bimolecular then its rate will depend on the product of concentration of the molecule uh, in state 1 and concentration of light. Okay. So, what will the rate of upward transition be? It will be n 1, where what is n 1? n 1 is the population well, rather say number, number of molecules in uh, state 1 multiplied by, have to multiply it by concentration of photons that is usually given by something called energy density. I will write it like this rho 1 to nu. It is a little bit of an overkill here because the moment I say nu, it appears that 1, 2 is taken care of, actually it is not. Energy density, rho everybody knows is density. Just to emphasize that it is density of energy and not of matter, we write nu in bracket and 1, 2 subscript is uh, there to denote what is the energy gap. Okay. Is there any other thing here for the rate? Concentrations are both taken care of concentration of light, concentration of molecule. The only thing that is left is the rate constant and Einstein for whatever reason wrote this rate constant as B, I can write 1, 2. All right. So, B 1, 2 is the rate constant for absorption. It is called Einstein's B coefficient, well, but we can come to that later. Rho 1, 2 uh, nu is the energy density. Can anybody, does anybody remember where we encountered energy density? in some very uh, highly celebrated black body radiation. right? In black body radiation, we had studied energy density and there is some expression for it right? from Planck theory. So, I will write that expression here, so that we can use it later on. That expression is and also you, you might want to write it down because this is going to be useful. I can write like this rho 1 2 of nu is equal to 8 pi h by c cube nu 1 2 cube e to the power well divided by e to the power h nu by k t. This k is not rate constant, this k is Boltzmann constant minus 1. This expression for energy density is going to come extremely handy in uh, the next 5 10 minutes. Right. So, this is energy density that is known, number of molecules in state 1 is n 1 and the rate constant is b 1 2. So, this is the uh, rate of formation of n 2 from n 1, rate of absorption. What about this process? Again, now I can start writing from the beginning because we know basically what it is. Again, it is sort of a bimolecular reaction between 
energy and matter. So, there will be some rate constant and again I will write B and this time instead of 1 2 I will write 2 1. Of course, I will have rho 1 2 nu, there is no point in writing rho 2 1 nu because energy density of a particular frequency will be the same right that is a property of light actually and then multiplied by n 2 or n 1 n 2. What is n 2? n 2 is the number of molecules in state 2. Okay. Now, what about this spontaneous emission process? That is like an elementary uh, unimolecular reaction because no light is there. Molecule has been excited fine, but it has been excited by the absorption process. When it emits, it emits on its own. So, here the only quantity that will be important is N2. And the rate constant here is written as A12, Einstein's coefficient for spontaneous emission. So, here we have three Einstein's coefficient. A12 is Einstein's coefficient of spontaneous emission, A21 sorry. As you will see in a while it will not matter. A21 is Einstein's coefficient of spontaneous emission, B21 is Einstein's coefficient of stimulated emission, B12 is Einstein's coefficient of you can say stimulated absorption. Okay. So, this is the formulation of Einstein problem. Now, we will go ahead and actually write the rate equation, but Again, we are going to use something that we have studied in chemical kinetics and that is your steady state approximation. Remember steady state approximation? When you have something like a reactant going to a product P through an intermediate I, what is steady state approximation? Di dt equal to 0, I in third bracket of course, concentration of the intermediate is 0. Right? Now, what will happen? How do you get that? concentration equal to 0 because what you say essentially is that the rate of formation is equal to the rate of well deformation would sound strange rate of breakdown. So, here we can say that at steady state rate of formation of 2 is equal to rate of depopulation of 2 which means B12 rho 1 2 of nu into N1 should be equal to a sum of B21 rho 1 2 nu into N2 multiplied by uh, sorry plus plus inside brackets A21 N2. Okay. Let me write it. What I am saying is at steady state dN2 dt equal to 0. Okay. Now, let me write the expression for dN2 dt. B12 rho 1 2 of nu N1. Then I should write if I am going to follow from here, I should write minus B21 rho 1 2 of nu N2 minus A21 N2 is equal to 0. I okay. will step jump a little bit and write something like this. B12 rho 2 rho 1 2 nu into N1 is equal to B21 rho 1 2 of nu multiplied by N2 plus A21 into N2. Clear? Now, uh, we uh, go ahead and uh, try to find a solution for this one. Well, uh, try to find a solution means what we will do is we already know the expression for rho 1 2, right? We will try to uh, find the expression for rho 1 2 and from there we will try to get an idea of what A is and what B is to the maximum extent possible. So, what I want to do is I want to collect the terms in rho 1 2. So, whatever is there in rho 1 2 we can bring to left hand side. So, let us proceed. Rho 1 2 of nu multiplied by B12 N1 minus B21 
n 2 is equal to a 2 1 n 2 simple. So, you write rho 1 2 nu is equal to a 2 1 n 2 by b 1 2 n 1 minus b 2 1 n 2 is this correct. Now, is a good time to write the other expression once again and start comparing. What was Planck's expression? Rho 1 2 at nu equal to 8 pi h nu 1 2 by c whole cube divided by e to the power h 1 2 by k t minus 1. Right. So, what I will try to do is I will try to write this expression in black in such a way that it will look more or less like the expression in blue and then we will just compare the terms. How do I do that? Uh, second term has to be 1 minus is already there. So, how do I get second term equal to 1? If I just divide numerator and denominator by the second term, then I will get 1. So, that is a good seems to be a good starting point. So, I can write a 2 1 well n 2 by n 2 is equal to 1. So, I will not write that divided by b 2 1 that is what I have in the numerator. Are you following what I am doing? I am dividing numerator as well as denominator by this and in the denominator I know the second term is very easy that is minus 1. What is the first term? First term is b 1 2 by b 2 1 multiplied by n 1 by n 2 right. Now, see we have two energy levels one is lower and uh, energy uh, lower in energy two is higher in energy. So, we actually know what this n 1 by n 2 is do not we Boltzmann distribution what is n 1 by n 2? Remember n 1 is lower energy n 2 uh, n 1 is uh, the population of lower energy level n 2 is the population of higher energy level. So, it will be e to the power h nu 1 by uh, h nu 1 2 divided by k t right. We are more used to writing the higher energy one in the numerator that is why you get e to the power minus h nu by k t here we have written the uh, lower energy population at the top. So, and then you uh, now uh, see it is folding uh, unfolding in front of your eyes this n 1 by n 2 turns out to be e to the power h nu 1 2 divided by k t. Okay. Now, compare this expression with this expression. What is the first thing we get? First thing we get is that this b 1 2 by b 2 1 has to be equal to 0 right. So, as to get the right denominator. So, first thing we learn is 1 sorry sorry b 1 2 by b 2 1 yeah if it is 0 then we can go home. is equal to 1 or I can write like this b 1 2 equal to b 2 1 I do not need 1 or 2 anymore I can just write it as b. So, this is your Einstein's b coefficient and the uh, message it carries after such a simple uh, exercise is profound. What you are saying is that for an induced process for a given two, uh, two level system rate constants for the upward and downward processes are actually the same. Okay. And this is something I can remind you of what we have discussed earlier. Remember we had said sometime that your uh, quantum yield fluorescence quantum yield is uh, related to epsilon. Right? epsilon is something that you measure from absorption spectrum 
right. So, and that is an intrinsic quantity, it has got to do with probability of transition from lower state to higher state. Emission quantum yield talks about probability of transition from higher state to lower state. I hope you have not forgotten that we had said these two are correlated. If epsilon is high for a molecule, then quantum yield is also expected to be high. There is a reason why I say expected to be and not is, we will come to that shortly. But do you understand that they are expected to be high, why? Because of this, because B12 and B21 rate constants, they essentially are measures of probability of transition, probability of transition from 1 to 2 and from 2 to 1. So, what we are saying is for induced processes, the probabilities are the same no matter whether it is an upward transition or a downward transition. That is why your uh, emission quantum yield and epsilon should be correlated. I am not saying equal, correlated, proportional. Has everybody understood? Is everybody uh, comfortable with this? I am not comfortable because if you remember all the emission that we have talked about earlier is spontaneous emission. And what we have shown here is that B12 equal to B21, here the process of emission that we are talking about is stimulated emission. So, if I am going to say what I just said, then I would better establish some kind of a linear relationship between stimulated emission and uh, spontaneous emission as well. Of course, for that I do not have to go very far, it is right there in front of our eyes. Look at the numerator here, look at the numerator here. What you see from here is, now there is no need to write 1 and 2, so I will just write A. Okay. So, I see that A by B is equal to 8 pi H nu 1 to L cube by C whole cube. So, A is actually proportional to B. All right. So, it is ok if I am talking about uh, spontaneous emission as well, because after all spontaneous emission, uh, well uh, rate constant of spontaneous emission Einstein's A coefficient varies linearly with Einstein's B coefficient. So, there is no problem. Well, there is more that we want to say about this A and B business, but uh, let us do that in the next module.